Well, hello. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thank you for visiting. It is my pleasure. So you're in the new home. I am. Yeah. Is it like a new castle or is it a new shanty town? Like, how do you feel so far about this place? Uh, I think it feels like a castle. Wow. Yeah. That's, Very happy that's... about it. Yeah. It's got yeah. Everything I need. What else could you need? <laughs> exactly. So it's actually, it's the, um, it's the very same unit that I was in. I used to live on the 17th floor. Okay. And now, as you can see behind me, I'm sort of, we're in a high rise area. Oh, that looks awesome. And I'm just down seven floors in the same unit. <laughs> well, that's, that's really cool. I've always lived down near the earth in Florida. We're very flat. So mm -hmm. I don't even, you, there's probably less than 10 buildings that tall in the entire like Bay area where I'm at. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, this is quite a built up high rise area here. You're in Toronto, good. right? Are you in the city or? Uh, yeah, I'm in the West end. So I'm in high park. Okay. You know Toronto at all. So it's still, I'm on the yeah. subway line. It's still, it's still considered downtown Toronto. Okay. As far yeah, as I know my, downtown. Uh, yeah. As far as my insurance is, is considered, it's downtown, but it's uh, definitely not downtown. It's kind of on the, the inner suburb. Of Toronto. Okay. Do you uh, do you wish you were closer to the city or further out in the country, or what? What made you want to? Oh no, my my goal my goal is to be way out in the country. I don't like living in the city at all. Not okay. at all. Yeah. Uh -huh. so you know, miss like the the convenience and like the grocery stores and. Um, you know, yeah, I like all that stuff. So I'm, I'm actually just, my stepdaughter is just pulling something off the counter right now. So I'm just you keeping an eye on her. Yeah. No, I think, I think we're okay. I think she's just getting herself a, the last of her breakfast. Okay. Very good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I wouldn't like, I like, I like that we have the, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker is all right here. It's very, very easy. Yeah. And you know, we can walk to the restaurants and the pubs and that kind of stuff, which oh, is nice. Toronto especially. Yeah. Yeah, but I would much rather be able to walk to the lake or to the river or to walk into the forest. That's yeah. way more important to me. The air is so different, I think. Yeah. Um, just to speak it, about the breath. <laughs> yeah, and, and Toronto, P, the, Toronto wants to be New York and it's not. <laughs> What is all. it? What's what is it trying to be when it tries to be New York? It, it wants to have that energy of New York. That's you know that vibrant like like New York is a living entity in itself, uh -huh. right? It's not. It's nothing else. It's like it's like London and Paris and that kind of thing. It's like a, it's a city. Yeah, it doesn't everything worry about else other in the world, it doesn't worry about it. like but everything else like Toronto and Chicago and Miami. We're not we're not real cities. We're just trying to be something else. <laughs> It is interesting because there's a lot of New Yorkers that live in Florida and uh, coming from New York, they'll say they're from New York even 20 years later when they've lived here forever. Their yeah. family. Yeah, most most of their there. life has been in Florida. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But the identity of a New Yorker or um, uh, mm -hmm. even if you say like, oh, that New York attitude, people kind of know what you mean. Although I yeah. think Toronto has a vibe too. I think Toronto has like just a more cosmopolitan attitude maybe. It feels like a definitely its own place, though. Yeah, it's definitely its own place. Yeah, but we just, um, I don't know what it is. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's, there's a, I don't know. I'm just not a city guy. Yeah, I, I hear you. I love both. I love uh, the open country. I was out this morning for like almost two hours outside, like at the beach, just watching birds fly around and, and enjoying the sounds of the ocean and, Mm -hmm. seeing cars drive by and stuff and uh that's pretty marvelous you really can't get that inside of a store <laughs> that's that's right now on the plus side where i live is literally a 30 second walk to high park which is this massive urban park it's a yeah. forested area with trails I, I walk my dog there only i only have my dog half the time now so she's with me for a week and with my ex for a week uh -huh. so she goes back and forth with my son that's so, so modern yeah yeah but, and then we also have like a beautiful clean beach here as well. Like we go down every Saturday. We're going to kind of get into the rhythm of how this is going to work. But uh -huh. uh, every Saturday for a couple of years, well, I've been doing it for about eight years. But for the past, during the pandemic, the past two years, my Saturday meetup down at the beach has just exploded. We have 30, 40 people down there now. Yeah. Doing, and I guide breath work, have my drum out, banging my drum, guiding the breath work. And then we all go for a swim in, in Lake Ontario together. 
that that really sounds like being else. alive yeah that sounds excellent yeah. <laughs> yeah i i uh i think maybe people are realizing some people that uh they miss nature or they miss that feeling of being alive that you can't really yeah. get indoors or on zoom or <laughs> those places yeah i think people really found that they were taking things for granted yeah that's a great way to now say they're, it. and yeah. now they're making the effort like you're you're shot off of a rocket and you're like wait i might miss earth and then mm -hmm. finally you come back from the space station you're like oh this is way better yeah <laughs> bit of a stretch maybe but no um, it makes sense yeah so so let me read us like a little script thing and we'll jump into these questions if you want mm -hmm. yep. okay cool yep. so do you see me wearing your shirt excellent <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite shirts i get compliments on it more than almost any shirt that i own oh nice yeah yeah. Oh, okay. why am I beeping? Hold on. Oh, you're good. Yeah, get rid of that beep. <laughs> there we are. I've a lot, lot of, lot of things have changed for me in the past two weeks. I'll bet. So, yeah, those little rhythms, those little routines. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything's like different or whatever. Yeah. So this, this used to be our family computer, this laptop that I'm on. So we uh -huh. all had our own profiles, and I never got email or text messages or anything like that on it. I use my phone for that. But I've wiped it clean and set it up as my system now. Uh -huh. And now, so like that little beep was the email was going off because it wasn't, I haven't learned how to not have a beep happen. <laughs> I liked that about moving. I liked the, the need to relearn my routines and the need to re, mm. like, I think, you know, not to get too off topic, but like Native Americans would burn everything or get rid of everything once in a while and mm -hmm. you know, why would you get rid of everything it's so valuable your stuff but then there's that creative freedom or that kind of rediscovery yeah um, when you release all that stuff you realize that it's it wasn't needed at all like we think we need stuff and i just divided all like i was a minimalist person anyway and then i just divided all of my minimal stuff in half <laughs> exactly and i'm realizing i'm not missing any of that I don't miss anything and you have the space to notice you don't miss it i think when you shrink mm -hmm. back or pull back you're like oh yeah i didn't need that store or that routine or that yeah. person even if you want to get a little social yeah. or whatever uh, yeah yeah all right i'm going to read the script and okay. we're going to talk about john rubecki so please let me know if you have any questions or clarifications are needed at any point in the process the goal of this is to assist a team of people creating a video on John Verbeke. This is an exploration of what he's talking about, how his ideas are used, and why they are important now. I will be recording this and sharing with others. An edited version may be created to share online, but I will not share anything publicly without first allowing everyone in the video uh, so you an opportunity to view the final work. So is that all good? Yep. Awesome. So question number one, okay, good. You can, you can hunt me down. You have my address because that's how the shirt got here. That's so. right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll find you. Oh, goodness. I better be on my best behavior. Um, so question number one is, uh, who is John Verveke and what does he mean to you? Well, John Verveke is a prof at the University of Toronto. Um, that's really all I know of him. I've only met him a handful of times um, and only online. Oh, that's not true. I met him in person once at the uh, Stoic, Stoicon, Stoicon X, where we were both giving a talk. And um, so that's really all I know. And he explores the kind, science, same kind of space that I am attempting to explore. So, yeah, what was it like? Uh, did you see his talk at Stoicon or how did, did you interact with him at all? Yeah, what was that like? That seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> it's like pre-pandemic. But the day was a blur. Um, I found his talk really interesting. Um, as much as I can remember the details of his talk. Um, I'm trying to pull out the details from the, the cobwebs of my mind here. Um, it it wasn't it it didn't it wasn't as academic as I had expected. That whole day wasn't as academic as I expected it to be. Um, there were other professors there of philosophy and, and whatnot, except for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, had some uh, imposter syndrome going on that day. Uh, so I thought it was going to be much more um, university lecture style, but it was a little bit more relaxed than, than that. So that's, that's really what I remember of that. 
Yeah. And um, did anything initially interest you about what he talked about or even that just stood out that day? So I think it's kind of cool that you just went to a stoic on that's, that's a, uh... I think it was just in the overwhelm of, of being there. Cause I was a presenter that day as well. So I was just sort of in the overwhelm of being there and being on stage and, and I was talking to a lot of people all at the same time, different conversations happening all over the place. So um, there wasn't any one single standout piece to the day or to his talk or to anybody's talks. Um, just that it was all, and it's all kind of, by now, it's all kind of melded together in my head. Yeah, of course, yeah. Right. It's just kind of cool because, yeah, who, who gets to go to a con like that and then have a bunch of speakers, especially one like John, just be there talking mm -hmm. about the view from above or cognitive yeah. dissonance or something like that. Mm -hmm. I did, yeah, actually, thinking now, you actually <laughs> kind of triggered the memory a little bit more. Um, the view from above is, uh, I, I really, I really enjoyed that. I had done something like that before, um, which kind of triggered an out of body like experience for me. Um, but it was in a, a very deep meditative setting. This was in with, with John's, I was just listening to how he was presenting it mm -hmm. and not going into that deep meditative state so much. Um, but it was the setting. It was like a, an auditorium with chairs and people, you know, burping and farting and shuffling their papers. So it was not, wasn't my kind of space to meditate, yeah. but it was a really good experience to, for me to learn how he presents such a thing. Do you remember something that jumps out? Like you don't have to be too detailed or analytical, but was there something like, oh, wow, that was cool. Yeah, he was, um, he was guiding that meditation in just a, a matter of fact kind of way. He wasn't, he was just talking it through and letting everybody else's minds make up their own story of how this plays out, how it works. There was no details to anything. It was just the details in your mind. They're not, they weren't for John to give you the details. The details are just how you want to make them be there. Um, so yeah, it was that, that easygoing dialogue or monologue in this case that he was just speaking it through and letting everybody else do that journey. And so I've actually taken a lot of that in, in how I guide my meditations now, um, mm -hmm. and just letting the details go and letting, you know, whatever's alive in your heart, <laughs> that, that is, that is what I, what I try to get to now without trying to be too specific. Cause I, I guide a lot of um, future self meditations. And when I first started doing that, I was doing it based on how it had been, how I had learned that from other people. And it was, there was always a lot of details given to me from an external source. And so I just could let all that go and don't really add any details and just let your own imagination, your own subconscious psyche, you know, spirit, <laughs> whatever is in there, fill in the blanks. Yeah, give the user more credit. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Okay, question number two. Um, this might be, if this is too technical, we can just move on. It says, um, what are the four ways of knowing? So this is stuff that John talks about in his videos. Um, and why are they an improvement on how most educators teach about the mind and human knowledge? So he talks about, do you know the four ways? of? Uh, not, I probably have heard something about that, but I don't know specifically what John is talking about here. Yeah, one of the things I, I wanted or I thought it would be kind of cool about you being asked about this is you're not like a fan of his and you're not following him around or doing those mm -hmm. things. But you, like you said, you're, you appreciate him. You're in the space he's in um, mm -hmm. and those kind of things. So I thought, and you, you've meditated with him and, and interacted mm -hmm. with him. So I think you're not like a total foreigner or anything like that. So, so we'll skip that and we'll skip the next one as well, which is kind of technical. Um, so this, this, you might be able to say something too. So are there any barriers do you think to appreciating understanding or applying ideas from John's work. Are there any barriers to it? Yeah, like, you know, some people will say, I don't want to leave the question too much, but some people will say like, it's really hard to understand him or he says a lot in a very short amount of time. Are there things that, that you maybe have ever noticed that make, might make it hard for someone to appreciate his stuff? Yes, I think so. Um... I, f I feel like when we did um, the, the circling meditation uh, the, on Zoom, 
a year ago yeah it was it was actually about six <laughs> months ago yeah i know was it yeah yeah like, yeah um john goes between um just listening and waiting for people to say things and then just absorbs that to almost an info dump of information where where he just turns it on and but he's not he's not i think i what struck me in the circling was that it was just his i guess it's the point of circling it's just the point that the point it, it it was just him hearing his thoughts out loud and he's a brilliant man so there's a lot of thoughts <laughs> to listen to in that um so that was my experience that now, but that wasn't the same as the way he lectured at Stoicon at all. Those are two very different interactions with him. Um, I think if I wasn't in a meditation with him and I heard him just blah, all this stuff out, it would be like, whoa, back off, <laughs> get your own meditation. Um, but but at, at the lecture at Stoicon, it was, yeah, I, I don't see any um obstacles or any, or any anything yeah no, i wouldn't say so, so. I mean, and, and just for for clarity because people will listen to this you and i and john and some other people did some circling for like a month and and met and did some meditation i think we did the view from above once as well uh before one of them mm -hmm. um and then john participated in your kind of commentary on that so yep. um all right number five um I'm going to reword this a little bit, but do you think it's important to be conscious and purposeful with your language, the words you use, even like listening to the words other people use? Because John's very, like you said, technical and has like a lot of conceptual things happening when he speaks. So like how important is it? Um, uh, yeah, maybe to get a sense of what I'm trying to ask here. It's a little, um, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I think it is extremely important uh, to be careful with how you speak and Jeez, and, and, th and, and thoughtful about every word that you say is critical to the point you're trying to get across, especially um, in the in this world now um, where we're talking to people from all sorts of different places all over the world. I know most most of the people who come to to my things are North American handful of Europeans, but also some other people from everywhere else. But even like the language I use with people outside of Toronto is going to be different, right? It's, and you have to, so I try and take that into account when, when I'm relaying information to people is that words mean different things to different people. So just uh, be very careful and concise and not over doing it a lot of the time. So it's useful, but don't overdo it. Yeah. I like that. That's simple. And I can, I can grasp that with my mind. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, John talks about this concept of ecology of practices, you know, having many practices that complement each other and not maybe just one practice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any practices that you do daily, weekly, or wish that you did? And then do you have any like thoughts or comments on maybe the importance or value of an ecology of practices versus a practice or no practices? Um, yeah, I think the ecology of practice is critical to uh, mental, physical, uh, spiritual health. Absolutely. Um, I think anybody who says, you know, this, this is the way, there's only one practice, do this, you're very misguided. <laughs> there, there has to be different practices for different things. Um, I'm not in the same mood every day. So how, oh. why would it, why would a practice be like so singular? There has to be a different practice for different things at any, at any given point. So you need a whole array of things that you need. Do you have like a like list is probably a bad word, but like things that you try to do weekly or even daily or anything like that? Um, yeah, I do have a daily, you know, my go-to is, is my breath, the stoic breath. That's my go-to. Um, so that's sort of the, the top, the, the pinnacle of my, my ecology. Maybe it's the base of the ecology. I don't know which way the triangle goes there, but it's, it's, one of the, it's part of the triangle. It's an important part of my triangle. Um, 
and and then everything else grows from that. So I had my breath practice, which I try to, I was doing, you know, nearly daily. Lately, it's been kind of all over the place, falling back into routines and figuring out how it all works again. Um, but that's that's my my piece. But then I have you know my my ice dip on the weekend, which I'm guiding. Um, so, but guiding a meditation and ice dip is part of the ecology of practices. You know that guiding is really important, and then guiding the stoic breath is also really important to me. I have my own practice, my own personal practice, but then guiding a practice is part of my meditation. It's part of my health. Um, so that how, I guide how does that, that work? Like I'm I'm young and new to this. Maybe like what does what does it give you? Because um, I, yeah. I believe you. I think you're probably mm -hmm. saying something really mm -hmm. interesting here. So part of um, part of guiding a practice for other people, I have to get myself into a different kind of meditative space. I'm in I'm in the I'm in that space that people go to in a practice. I, I drop myself into the weird. I call it the weird space, a foot in both worlds. I'm, I'm definitely there. Um, usually, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I can't get there. I'm just distracted. There's stuff going on, and I can't can't shut it all down. Um, so, and and it's it's critical for me to be able to get into that space to be able to hold space for the practice. Even in this digital realm, I have to be in a space to hold space. So, and that's, and then when I'm finished with that, um, I feel like I've been in a very deep state of meditation that whole time. Wow. Um, yeah. And I kind of, often I just lose myself and I, I go back to the recording and listen to it and go, whoa, is that what I said? I have no idea. It's just stuff comes out. I kind of yeah. go into, it's the weird, the weird stuff. So that's, that's a critical part of my meditation is teaching meditation and breath work. So that's part of my ecology as well. So doing the work, my own practice is like the foundation. So I've decided it's the base of my triangle is the, is my own. but then also teaching it and guiding people in it is another part of that ecology. Um, then I just have quiet um, touchstones throughout the day, little simple heart meditation or simple breath awareness meditation, just when I need to, when I got, got a little wound up over something, just come back to heart or breath is are my go-to's and i have um, a plant medicine ceremony that i do on a, um, a fairly regular basis with a uh, uh, ceremonial tobacco is uh is i think I you've talked use. about this uh, yeah yeah my my yes my the the happy so it actually right. yeah yeah so it's a ceremonial tobacco. this is actually the my curate that i use to serve other people so i, I take people through this ceremony as well um, which is also, I do that at the beach, actually, with the breath work and the cold exposure. Oh, that's great. We have a happy ceremony, which is an Amazonian uh, ceremonial tobacco mixed with other, okay. with the with the ashes of other uh, medicinal plants. Huh. I've got a lot in my, my ecology. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on. I hadn't really, I hadn't actually thought of these things as all separate pieces of an ecology. It is just the whole thing. It's the whole picture is all these things um, because this is my life it's not it's not my nine to five job it is me it is my life so i have all these things that are part of me and my life and i guess it is the ecology of practices yeah we compartmentalize but you've left the work world and the com compartmentalized world a little bit mm -hmm. and uh so so yeah this maybe leads into this next question so is there a meaning crisis um and then what is real about it in your life or the life of your friends or just in like the social cultural world at large? Yes, <laughs> there is a meaning crisis. Absolutely. It's tremendous. Um, and it's been going on for some time. I probably forever, perhaps, I don't know. But um, probably when we killed God is probably when the meaning crisis began. Um, not too heavy. <laughs> That's kind of habit. You're the first person to yeah. say that. Yeah. Because that, you're so direct. I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I love that yeah. about you. You're like one of the first things that actually drew me to you when we were talking is you're like, how's your day? And I said something and I asked you and you immediately just responded. You didn't pause and think of a story. You're just like, mm -hmm. yeah, Rob, here, I'm here with you. Like, I'm going to answer that question. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I take what you said kind of seriously. So maybe you could unpack that, maybe say it in a mm -hmm. different way. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, 
Nietzsche said it first, I think, or at least he's you know credited with uh, saying God is dead. But um, or was it Freud? It was Nietzsche. Nietzsche. It was Nietzsche. Freud, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was Nietzsche. Yeah, why would Freud say that? I don't know. Dad is dead. That's what Freud said. Um, <laughs> he might have actually said that. But then we did. Uh, so we, we we killed God, and then and then that God energy had to siphon down uh, to the sovereign energy, and we killed literally killed the kings and queens. Quite literally, we killed them. There's a few left, but they have no power. Um, and now we're we, you know we're deep in the business of of killing the father. You know, you just have to look at popular media and, and father is a joke. He's a joke character. He's a clown, right? Father is no longer the patriarch. The patriarch has been disassembled. It's in his death throes now. So, and, and, the, and the matriarch, you know, we, we killed the matriarch a long time ago. Uh, and we, we celebrate, you know, the immature feminine, the immature masculine. It's the Hollywood garbage. Um, so all these things that gave us meaning in our society are gone completely gone. And we've looked for, for meaning in, in all sorts of different places. And I was in the fitness industry as a personal trainer for a long time after I was a wilderness guide. And I got into that world just as the CrossFit thing exploded and CrossFit gyms were opening everywhere. And that was the new church. Right. It was they the are. new. Yeah. They're zealous. They'll, they'll break their legs and keep going and do keep the most going. foolish yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. With CrossFit, don't ask how, ask how many. <laughs> It's impressive some of the things they do, but then it's also just so naive. Like even hot yeah, yoga, yeah. I think can be like you're you're very knowledgeable and you look things up and you're careful. But like so many people take these mm -hmm. things for granted in such a way. It's like our body is very limited. Like it's very yeah. very limited. Um, yeah, and then the, the, you, and you brought up the yoga thing too, because at the same time, sort of before the CrossFit thing was the yoga thing, and that's where <laughs> they took like this one one tiny element of yoga and said let's do this one no no <laughs> yoga is this yoga is a big practice of breath and awareness and meditation and movement and and a spiritual connection to yourself going, no bend contort your body and if you can't do it do it in the heat <laughs> like whoa hold on here um and that and that was the new church as well that was a new community people were, were looking for the community through and that was you know the, the connection to something greater um, whether or not that worked for people, I don't know. I think so for some people, it, it mm -hmm. was good, mm -hmm. but not necessarily. Um, yeah, because so if you have it? a lot of other things going on in your life, like you have a healthy family life and you don't hate your job, then maybe that gave you some something to be okay. But if you're like yeah. a mess, and then you're you looking know. to the to the what is it called? Half a yoga? What is the uh, Raj? Yeah. What's the type? Yeah, it's, I don't know. Whatever it is, like yeah, there's a bunch. But whatever the <laughs> the bendy type that doesn't really care about the mind or the spirit or any of those mm -hmm. things that that type you know you're just guruizing the teacher yeah. or you know you're talking to people afterwards going like oh what happened i felt so good there but then i went back yeah. out in the real world it was gone or whatever because yeah exactly yeah. And, and that's what i see in my in my practice my one-on-one -on -one practice with people especially in the, the plant medicine world that i work in is they are looking for something deeper something that a meaning that's deep inside of them. Their soul is empty. Yeah. Um, whether Shouldn't I'm, everybody? I'm, Shouldn't we yeah. do that like all day or like at least once a year? <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, I think we should have a connection. That I mean, soul, I'm just throwing that word out there, whatever that means to you. Yeah, um, yeah. But that that thing inside of you that is more than you. Um, mm. We don't have a connection to it anymore. And it's just, we're just empty. And yeah. so we, we distract ourselves with, with the TV, with Hollywood. Right, that's the great distractor, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And now, um, and now we have our Instagrams and our TikToks and whatever they are um, to distract us even more. And it's just this constant um, lack of meaning. And we, not everybody knows that they're in a meaning crisis. People think they're just fine, living their their existence, their meaningless existence. They think it's just fine because their base base needs needs are met. You know, they have a home, they have food. You know, they're fine. There's no risk to them. But then a lot of people are just waking up and suddenly going, what is going, what's this for? Why am I doing this? What's, what's the point? Yeah, you can leave college with $100,000. I don't know what that is in Canadian dollars, 200,000 Canadian of millions. Debt. Yeah, you just have all this debt. Yeah. And you don't have a career path you've delayed marriage or you've been in a bunch of immature 
fraternity sorority yeah. relationships you don't even have yeah. like those roots and then you're just thrust into your adult life or or mm -hmm. or you have a fall from grace and lose a job or you know there's a million ways to enter into that tragedy where you just don't have yeah. a bunch it's, of valuable it's not things a, in your but life it's yeah. not a tragedy though you need to fall from grace. Well, yeah, yeah. Because that's yeah, where you yeah. find that you are in a meaning crisis. You need to have the crisis to know what's a meaning crisis. Yeah, yeah. Just just typing away at your office and then blindly going around doing your routines is like the worst mm -hmm. place to be probably. Yeah. yeah. And so for most most people that I work with who discover the, the meaning crisis, it's because of a divorce, a health crisis, or a loss of job. And not necessarily huh. their health crisis, somebody else's health crisis, or somebody else's divorce, because they're they're looking at my life and thinking, "Yeah, I was like really miserable too." Yeah, if you don't deal with your negative feelings, it's like not having a head or something like that. You're just mm -hmm. disconnected, and you're not sure why you feel the way you feel sometimes, yeah. or like you yeah. said, you just seek real things in movies or in these, you know, fake things and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think that's actually one of the best ways to be a good person is just live well, right? Because your friends will see you living well. And without you yeah. telling them how to live, they're going to be, they're going to notice that. They're going to go, oh, that's yeah. pretty cool. I like, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I should try a beer or something like that. I don't know if that's a silly <laughs> example. But, but yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's actually true because then they, they look and say, oh, you know, Steve seems really, really happy and he's got it together and he's got this great community around him. And then they think, well, why don't I have that? And so they then look at their lives and think, oh, because I just stumbled along and did all the stuff I'm supposed to do. And now there's no meaning in my life. Yeah, it is. You, you have to make decisions in life. It's really tough. You just even the best country or the best motto or the best culture, you still just can't go with the flow in that way. But yeah. Okay. So there's yeah. the next question. Um, again, you're kind of an outsider, so this might be a different answer, but is there something you wish John would talk about, um, especially related to this meaning crisis or the ecology practices or language and vocabulary and those kind of topics? Yeah. I don't, I don't really know what he has or hasn't talked about, you know, I've only, heard a handful of his lectures and met him a few times so i don't know the full spectrum do you think there's something that like someone that isn't a religious figure isn't this mainstream you know person could just be talking about more that that might help these like kind of counterculture people that are attracted to him um just have a good voice in their head or whatever have a good message to listen to um you mean what could he say to, to that? Yeah, to what's something you wish someone would talk about more? Maybe like in the midst of this meaning crisis, mm -hmm. is there some message people could be broadcasting or some conversations people could be having? Um, you know, th yeah, there is. And I don't know what it is because, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of pop culture icons now who talk about this stuff but they're talking about it in a way to glorify themselves or to sell their book or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and there's some big names that come to mind. I don't know if I need to name them, but. Um, yeah, one or two that jump out. That might give people an image. Well, you know, like the, the, the Joe Dispenza's, the Jordan Peterson's, um, those, those kinds of people who are talking about the crisis. Um, but they're, they're talking about it in their own, from their own ego. Um, instead of letting people discover what the meaning crisis is to them, you know, what, yeah, I'm having trouble finding the words for this. Um, it's part of the problem where there's a lack of role models to even look up to, mm -hmm. like there's no MLK and there's no, I don't know if there was a Canadian yeah. figures that were really um, kind of pure or honest or had integrity. Like there's just not a lot of leaders with integrity, I would say. Is that maybe part of the problem? There's no, yeah. Well, we're not, that, this, will, this will go back. There's, there's that death of the, the patriarch and the sovereign energy mm -hmm. is that we are, we just have, all of our leaders are just boys, little boys. There's a few little girls, but mostly just little boys leading the world, right? Mm -hmm. Who are just... 
and this is and then it's that it's that whole concept of of hero worship out of Hollywood. You know, that's what we end up having as our leaders, as our presidents and prime ministers, or just people. And heroes are just in it for themselves. It's the the the, the football star from high school, right? He's just in it for himself. He's in it to get the girls. Um, there's no there's no powerful energy there anymore leading the way, but rather people telling you what the way is. And the way is within. You know, the way isn't, you know, there's no, you know, five easy steps to solve the meaning crisis. It's, that doesn't exist. But that's what's being sold. That's what's being packaged and sold is that that kind of step-by-step -step practice. Yeah, no, it, it's it's hard work. It's it's lonely. It's boring. It's really fun, but in a way that's not like interesting to talk about or that your friends want to hear about sometimes. Um, so and yeah, just the those externals. I mean, they feel like they're internal, but they really are external. Like the lust and the the fame yeah. and the the wealth. Like how much money do you really need? Like I have a car yeah. that autopilots itself, and you live in a thirty story <laughs> building that you know, couldn't even be imagined a thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, and we're still like, why don't we have more? Why don't we have just a slightly smaller phone or whatever the current yeah. thing is, you know? So, huh, that's, that's awesome. That was a great response. Um, so I'll just go jump down to the last couple. Um, we'll talk about those. Talk about those. I mean, I, I'll ask you, do, do you do any, like, are there any books you like to read or even movies you like to watch or go to museums, any kind of like those cultural things that maybe, I know nature fills a huge part of your meaning and your family mm -hmm. also fills this massive, but is there any like more arty or, or book kind of stuff? Yes. Yes, okay. there is. Yeah, well, go um, ahead. Yeah, so actually right now, um, what book, I can't remember what it's called. It's right there, but anyway, it's book oh shadows in the something or other, but by Wade Davis. Finally, getting back to that book, and it's about cultural practices with plant medicines in the Amazon, and or not just the Amazon, but all over the place. But uh, indigenous practices with uh, indigenous spiritual practices is what it's about. Um, so I read a lot of stuff about that indigenous and ancient spiritual practices as I'm getting back in touch with my own. Um, I was a very strict atheist up until just a few years ago, until a spiritual. Op uh, awakening for myself. Um, so I'm learning, I'm, I'm relearning, I'm re-remembering that, that stuff, that story inside of me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I read a lot of, um, a lot of poetry, stacks of poetry books. You have a favorite poet or two? Uh, I wouldn't say I have a favorite poet, no. Um, I like all poems, all poetry, okay. whatever it is. Yeah, just like- The human heart. Poet. Yeah. And uh, but my favorite poetry book is uh, the Rag and Bones Shop. I think that's what it's called, the Rag and Bones Shop. Yeah, yeah, like, and I'm yeah. sure I don't know the exact name either, but I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And it, but it's broken up into categories of uh, of love and death and life and children, uh, mom, dad. So it's broken up into all these aspects of our relationships and health mm -hmm. and mental health and spiritual health. So wherever I'm feeling a crisis, a meaning crisis, whatever part of me, whatever comes up in meditation, I think, oh, I'm feeling a little bit empty. Uh, I can go to that book and just go to that section. And go, oh, I'll just read this one and whatever comes up. So I, it's a good, fun book. It's got some great stuff in there. But yeah, any, any kind of book. I, I love books. I'm rebuilding my bookshelves in my new home now and getting them all out and poking through them and reading parts that I've read before and just sort of getting to know some old friends again, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, that's an awesome way to say it. I, I like to earlier you were just saying about like ancestors, and I think I've appreciated that more because I've spent time with you. That that element that like talking about ancestors is not some weird foreign thing. That's everyone has ancestors. They did build your world. Um, mm -hmm. So so like that idea of of doing that is very. Um, it's not nostalgic. It's very meaningful. Um, it's very meaningful, yeah. And I actually had a, a great talk with someone who uh, was doing some ancestral work, but wasn't too sure what it all was. And we got on the topic of epigenetics because it's it's real, like it's measurable. Like yeah, your yeah. your genes, your your genetic expression changes throughout your life. You turn genes on and off based yeah, on yeah. what's going on in your life, and then you pass those genes on to your children. So you are passing on your lived experience to your children. 
Yeah, yeah. And their children and their children and their children. So people, so the, the whole idea of ancestral trauma is actually a measurable thing because it's in the genetic code of people that have been experiencing trauma generations ago is alive and well in populations now. Yeah, the, the, if you breed like foxes or rats or rabbits and you take the top half in terms of like friendliness, they've done it with uh, intelligence and then just only breed them within 10 or 20 generations, these mammals, the most friendly of the, like the not bred group is less friendly than the least friendly bred group. So you can just breed for like friendliness and it appears. You know, instead right. of intelligence, if you just take the top half of maze runners and only let them breed and then the bottom half and only let them breed after, mm -hmm. you know, 10 or 20 generations, because animals can live and die much quicker than people. We can yeah. see this, you know, the, the, the smart, the worst maze runner of the smart group is better than the entire other group. Like we really are just passing on. And then if you flip that into trauma and grief and failure to deal with anger issues and stuff like that, you know, yep. really, or if you work on it, like you said, there's redemption in our, in our uh, behaviors. Absolutely. Yeah. We can go in and, and change those genes ourselves. But there was another, there was another rat study where um, it's kind of a cruel one. There was, they, they made a sound like an alarm would go off and the, and the rat would be shocked. So it'd be like be hit with pain whenever the sound went off and then they stopped doing it and still sounded the alarm and those still have this reaction this this anticipatory yeah fear they've internalized reaction. it yeah. yeah and then they bred the rat and several generations later without playing that sound they played the sound to like the great 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 grandchildren of this rat and they responded with fear wow it was so like in their neurons yeah this uh, sound triggers this. into their yeah. consciousness yeah <laughs> Yeah, and we do that externally too, right? Because socially, we're like we 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 punish people's behavior subtly, and we reward people's behavior subtly. That mm -hmm. we're kind of like haunted by our our social conditioning too. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, last couple questions. Um, we've kind of talked about this, but I'll just ask it directly. How how important is community, friendship, and other pro social activities? How often and in what ways do you participate in these kind of things on a regular basis? Yeah, I don't care for friendship or community at all. It's useless. <laughs> it is, um, it's actually funny because part of this whole journey that I've been on, I had no use for friends a few years ago. You were being whole... sarcastic, just to be clear, because the internet- I was being sarcastic. sarcastic. Yes, I love friends. I, I need <laughs> friendship. I need community. I need to <laughs> hug my friends on a daily basis. I need that. I need a physical contact with my friends. I just need them badly. I crave that, that contact now, but I never used to at all. As huh. part of my, part of this spiritual awakening was this awakening that I need people in my life. I have an emotional body that needs to be fed, needs to be nourished. And our friendship and our community does that. It's, and that's one of, that's, that's a big part of the meaning crisis is that as we've lost community, as we lost church, no one goes to church anymore, right? And that's why CrossFit yeah. was so important and that the yoga was so important because that is suddenly that community now with my friends. It wasn't because somebody needed to do a thousand, you know, snatches and tear their shoulders apart. It wasn't about that. <laughs> it was because they could go to this place and try and somebody said, that's amazing and would, you know, hit them on the back or give them a hug. That's what people needed. And same thing with the yoga. Nobody needs to contort their body and pull their back and sweat and, you know, but they, they need to be with people who are doing what they're doing and supporting each other in that. And that's, that's what we have at the beach every Saturday. We have this yeah. huge growing community and we go in and swim in the frozen Lake Ontario. That's our community. Do you see and me come in every... I heard you say that. <laughs> I went, oh, my Floridian brain just like yeah. panicked and Sure, <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in the lake with you if I ever make it to Toronto again, though. I promise. Oh, for sure. I will. I will take you down special just for that. We'll wow. go down and yeah. I'm gonna have to fly up then. Is there any fly up uh, just for that border of border problems these days? No, no. Oh, I good. think it's wide open. Yeah. Wow. I think you just I need. For a while I yeah. 
Yeah, I think you need to be uh, you need to have a vaccine passport to come in easily. Oh, good. Yeah, or, I don't have any weird facilities or anything like that. So yeah, we, yeah. So yeah, that's that's all wow. you need. But yeah, yeah, it's easier. Yeah, you should come for a visit. I'm gonna have to do that. Yeah. Well, great. So uh, let's see. Um, mm. Yeah, so that community is is critical, and that is the the the, the I think the foundation of the meaning crisis is that we're just yeah. all alone. Even in your breath work, there's a small community and it feels personal. I mean, like yeah. I've been to that yoga culture that you were talking about. I used to get t-shirts. I would go to so many events and I liked it. Like to me, yeah. there's an adventure in going to the gym or something like that. Yeah. But um, yeah, it really uh, just, you know, being in a room full of cyclers does feel good. And you do like get the spirit of cycling. And yeah. like you said in the church, of course you get the spirit of community there and mm -hmm with your friends, like, especially volunteering, you've made me volunteer more and want to volunteer more just because we have these little talks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you become this quiet little group of people doing something important when you're picking up trash mm -hmm. on the beach or whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. It really, like, it feels good and it feels uh, like mm -hmm. solid or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, so the um, last kind of important question. Uh, do you know what kind of pizza a monk orders? Which kind of monk? <laughs> I don't know. If, is there, is there, what are the different types? Well, I would think a Buddhist monk is probably vegetarian, but I don't know for sure. But a Franciscan monk, he might like pepperoni. I don't know. <laughs> the, the canned answer that I wrote down is one with everything. Because he's uh, a monk, you know? Yes, one with everything. There we go. Okay. So these are two <laughs> fun questions to play with um, about John again. So... What does John have in common with Taylor Swift? I don't know, but only because I don't really know who Taylor Swift is. I know she keeps popping up on all this media stuff, and I don't know who she is. <laughs> She's a singer. but What about uh, Alanis Morissette? She's a Canadian singer. Do you yeah, her? I know who okay. she is. What does yeah. John have in common with Alanis? <clears throat> um, something ironic, I guess. What what is the difference between them? I don't know. Um, male, female. Um, Alanis Morissette is actually a big into meditation and uh, working on trauma and finding meaning, which is interesting. Those are similarities. So, yeah. So yeah. Like, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. And then if, if John or someone like John had a billion dollars mysteriously donated to their project, what kind of world do you think that would look like? I think it would, I think it could be a beautiful thing to have the resources to reach out to people who need to be reached. People who know that there, that there's a crisis, that there's something wrong, they don't know what it is. Um, if there is some way just to get the message out, I think the world could be a beautiful place. But it would take a huge number of resources simply because it is being the, the great distractor is at play here. The great distract Hollywood doesn't want people to know that there's a, a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. There was a guy that did a documentary. Um, he was a brilliant scientist, kind of like John. And it was about um, like how good marketing and the food industry was at rewording things as they became buzzwords to stop using products. So if like low fat stopped being attractive, they'd go to low carb. And then if someone yeah. said carbs are the problem, they'd switch over to like, you know, some other, and they just find new ways. Mm -hmm. So even if you were as an individual able to come up with the perfect documentary, Hollywood or the, the this machine would reform itself in such a way that your message would just be demolished. No one would even care yeah. about you. Or they buy you. Like, I don't know if you were uh, such a famous breath practitioner that like Google just bought you so you couldn't practice. They're like, well, he, he's making people think too clearly. We better mm -hmm. offer him $2 billion and see if Steve will just sell out or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. that, Well, that's actually the story of psychedelics. They became, so they, they became illegal in the 60s because it made people question the reality, including the reality of the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. And so the, the U.S. quickly began this war on drugs and, and, and made everything illegal. Hmm. 
Yeah, did you know they added um, the In God We Trust uh, during a war to, to our, our uh, whatever, the song or whatever? Yeah. Um, and I'm so focused on your your conversation that I don't even know my Star Spangled Banner anymore. <laughs> uh, but they added those kind of things. And even like the Roman government would change like the face of their coins and things that like, yeah. can make people uh, more patriotic and less mm -hmm. uh, less open to ideas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's it's an ancient practice, and it's a practice of control. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you've you've you don't want to control people. You work for the gig economy. How do you like that? I wanted to ask you, like, now you're a couple of years into this or something close to that. Yeah. Are, how do you do? You look at the rest of the economy differently now that you're not in this structured way, or do you like what you're doing, or do you hate what you're doing, or? Oh, I like what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I I really like it. It's um, it's it's the way forward, I think for, Why? Yeah. um, <clears throat> simply because it is a way for me to have meaning running my, my, my job, my work side, my paid work side as this gig economy, because we still need to raise money and, you know, still got to pay the bills. Um, but it allows me, like, I can't go to, you know, the office of meditation and work nine to five and teach breath work. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, so my life is my job. It becomes very, very fluid and I'm always doing stuff around the work. And then from, and then there's moments of revenue generation that fall in there as well. And it's just all very fluid and dynamic and there's no, there's no, structure to it and i think as as people are waking up to the meaning crisis and we are actually in this in the process of the, the great resignation right now people are not going back to their shitty jobs they don't want to can you blame you them know, they, <laughs> can, can you blame them like why why would you want to do that why would you want to work minimum wage at a grease trap and not only that, but like you're just not treated with respect, right? Like yeah. there, there's so much corporate structure that the people that come in and judge you and make decisions don't care about you. I worked, I lived in Michigan and I would eat at this fudge shop because fudge is amazing. And they would talk about how meaningful it was to hire young people and how they didn't really mind that they'd leave, even though like they needed them because they were happy to see them get jobs. And, you know, there was this sense of, of like community, even within the way people were thinking about work and the way they're thinking about like who they hired and uh you know you just can't have that when there's a board in california and they're worried about the bottom line and they just sold two hospitals to buy a condo that they're trying to profit on and there's just you know how, where's the people anymore when there's so much crazy moving parts um but yeah so that that's really cool i just love that um people can opt out and not feel like they're just like abandoning all hope because <laughs> really yeah. you are thriving and you are, um, mm -hmm. you know, happy with your life. And it's not mm -hmm. just like scary to, you know, take that first or second step away from, like you said, the Toronto that wants to be New York city or yeah. the, it is just like, you know, you're going to die one day. I think that's, part of why it's so meaningless to work 60 hours a week. It's not that it isn't really cool to yeah. see companies grow or to be part of a big team that does intercontinental <laughs> things, but it's just yeah. like you watch but it, your- But if that's your meaning, if that's your meaning, if that's your purpose mm. in life to grow this new company and make something incredible out of a company, then have at it, like go for it. If that's your meaning, then you're yeah, not yeah. in crisis. That's great. That's wonderful. But you know, just working for the big megacorp you know, grinding away, yeah. crunching they're, numbers, they're or whatever it is, or they're or the people yeah. that are working at the companies they build. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. That does yeah, just that's uh, different. Yeah, that's different. So yeah, I don't, I don't see it. We're not going to have the, the collapse of of the Western Empire. That's not happening. But people <laughs> are going to be moving away from the the end, like the de the dead end jobs, the miserable existence. People, those those are the ones who are waking up. It's well, not... it forces the companies to reconsider too, right? When they see 10% of their workforce leave, they can't say, oh, it was just one idiot or one person. Then they go, oh, maybe we are treating people like garbage. Maybe we do need to offer some of these benefits that they had in the 40s and 50s. You know, maybe it won't go back to those gorgeous pensions plans and crazy, you know, $80 an hour pay that Detroit had for their auto workers, but they could at least pretend to care more or you know there are some companies i think that do great jobs maybe trying to 
keep mm -hmm. all parts of the thing thriving, yep. not just the top or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's going to happen with that is people who do want to be in that you know, corporate world, they, they don't need to be in New York, in Miami, in Toronto, in Chicago. They can be anywhere. They, or somebody in Toronto can go work for a company out of LA. That's great because it's all just digital now. It's just all online. That was the great change that's happened. So these people at sort of that level where they're comfortable, they make good money, you know, they, they pay the bills, everything is good, but they're in a meaningless job. They can go and stay in their field and find meaning with another corporation somewhere in the world without ever leaving their home. So we're, we're, we're starting to dismantle nation states in a way. Mm. This is, the it beginning. is weird. Yeah. Yeah. And then the people at the, the, the bottom echelon who just have really crappy jobs, like you're serving French fries and you hate it. There's no meaning there. And I'm not talking about the kid with a part-time job. I'm talking about somebody who's, you know, this is their life now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the ones who aren't coming back. They're just saying, forget it. Like there's no point like being poor serving yeah. fries or being poor, not serving fries. Yeah. You know, I just won't serve fries. Yeah. You know, I, I'm no more poor. <laughs> right. So that those, and those are the people who are actually waking up to a meaning crisis first. It's that sort of, it's, it's the poor, it's the working poor who are waking up to it. Yeah, it's, it's apparent, so right? If, if, it's in yeah. your life. You see it clearly because you're not even uh, seduced by all the nice things you have that is kind of tricking the people mm -hmm. at the top or the middle class, right? Like I, I, you and I are kind of both part of this very successful middle yeah. class in some way. Yeah. And we're not seeing the suffering, but like you're saying, below mm -hmm. the nice part, like let them eat cake. Like let's look, look a little lower here yeah. and see what the rest yeah. of society is looking at. Yeah, and it's horrible, yeah. right? It is like, uh, no matter what they raise minimum wage to, there's no dignity in being it's still minimum wage or 47 or having three kids and, you know, mm -hmm. making even twice the minimum wage is not. Yeah. What you want so to go, doing going back to a previous yeah. question, if, if Raveki suddenly had like an infinite money yes, or whatever it was, like um, if there was a, a universal basic wage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could just opt out. Right? You could leave. Just opt out. And then like nobody's yeah. just going to sit at home and watch Netflix. So, you know, some people will, some, some people are just, will. Yeah, some people are just them, lazy, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> but those people have already found a way to take advantage of the system anyway. Yeah, fine. Good, good point. But most people um, who are in, who are in that position, they've had, you know, some bad luck in life. They didn't, you know, upbringing wasn't great, didn't get to go to a great school, haven't had all the opportunities in life. And so now they're stuck at a dead end job. That's how that happens. Nobody, there's no, you know, 10 year old thinking, uh, when I grow up, I want to work at McDonald's. You know, nobody wants that you know everybody wants to be that in school yeah yeah everybody wanted to be an astronaut right that's that's what we strive we strive for the stars well that's you want dignity you want, want self-respect mm -hmm. you want a life that you can look at and be proud of and not mm -hmm. feel like you need to slink back from or that you don't yeah. have what other people will have and, yeah. or that you're even worse i think that you're you see your kids not being able to have a life that you know other people's kids will have like yeah that sucks i mean and, and when you're working and raising a family or even just working and trying to also get educated we've already talked about how the education system isn't even like a way out anymore or no it's actually know. part of the problem and what it, do you say about that you then this will maybe we'll wrap it up on this yeah, yeah. what's what's the but problem there wait well, it traps you right it, it's part it's part of the system it's part of the machine is to make sure that you are just another brick in the wall right that's <laughs> that's what the education system is that's what it was right to, right from the beginning like the the public education system <clears throat> came along with the <clears throat> with the um, industrial revolution, and it was because they had to take mom and dad from the farm and stick them in a factory. So they had to do something with the kids. So we may as well train the kids to be factory workers. That's what the education system was for: was to train more factory workers. The rich the rich kids who were in you know in the castles and the estates with all the servants. They didn't go to the same kind of schools. They had nanny that came and taught them how to become international business people, how to become earls and knights and barons, whatever they were. So there's already a two-tier education system. One was to enslave the population. You know, not necessarily, you know, they weren't slaves, but all the money they made had to go to boards staying alive. So they may as well have been. Right? Well, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. And the have. education is still like that. And, and the university system is like that now. It is to trap you in a way of life that fits the paradigm of, of our world. 
yeah, they're, they're not teaching people how to think very well. They're not giving them even skills that much. They're just giving them these kind of information, knowledge worker assignments that don't make them happy and that don't uh, make them dream. Like, you know, you want to, I wish I had a teacher in college. I mean, I had a lot of teachers like this, but I, I wish I had kids when they had teachers in college that made them like want to learn more or, you know, paint or, yeah. cross a sea or you know do something inspiring not just like become you know someone in a, in a boring looking outfit at a boring looking building doing you know something electronic with paper and you know yeah. just not no no joy you know i watch people fish in the morning we were talking at the very beginning about going out in nature and there's there's i didn't even appreciate it for a long time but then i just kept being around these people and there's a joy in them that is in like you know their participation with the sea yep. they, they they like being up that early they like being there all day you know it's like if that was the way they felt at work they might not be at the sea but they're at the sea feeling these things and you go oh wow why doesn't everyone do that for four hours a day <laughs> yeah exactly there's Anyways. a great story there's a great story about that um where there was like a, a rich businessman was on was on a holiday on some island and he was watching this fisherman who would get up early every day and he'd load his net into his boat and go out of the bay and go fishing all day and come back. And the rich businessman said, you know, you could take some of your money and buy a second boat. And the, the fisherman said, well, what would I do with a second boat? I have a boat. Said, well, then you could hire somebody to go fishing with you and get twice as much fish. Well, what would I do with twice as much fish? Well, then you could sell it and buy even more boats. Well, what would I do with more boats? Well, then I would have more people to work for you and make more money. And then, well, what do I do with more money? Well, then you can have a bigger house and you can go on vacations. And well, what do I do on vacation? Well, you could go fishing. <laughs> yeah, waste your whole life trying mm. to just get what you already have right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Exactly.